Hi everyone. So my name is Vicki Archer. I'm a general surgery resident here at McMaster, and I'm also in my first year of the health research methodology program um, at McMaster as well. And I'm going to talk today about our systematic review, intravenous acetaminophen for postoperative pain control after open abdominal and thoracic surgery in pediatric patients. So when managing pain after surgery for clinicians, it often feels like a balancing beam between managing opioid exposure and uncontrolled pain. And in pediatric patients, this is especially challenging. They're in a constant state of neurologic and physiologic growth, which attenuates the adverse events of opioids and uncontrolled pain. Both of these are associated with increased adverse events physiologically, as well as long-term neurodevelopmental delays. So it's critically important to manage both opioid exposure and control pain in these patients. As we've done more research in pain, we know it's less of a teeter-totter and more of a spider web with many different variables interconnected that can help us control pain. Some of these variables easier to manipulate than others. There's lots of different areas you could look at in terms of multimodal pain control, but what we've chosen to focus on is non-opioid adjuncts to pediatric pain control regimes. Very specifically, we wanna look at intravenous acetaminophen. There's research in other settings, such as from emergency departments, orthopedic procedures, and in adult research showing that it's efficacious and it's safe. But there's been very little research done in the context of postoperative pain after major abdominal and thoracic surgery, which are incredibly painful events. Acetaminophen rectal and oral formulations. And the questions often ask, why would we use intravenous over oral and rectal, which is a reasonable question. There's two broad categories of why we might do that. The first being logistic. So after surgery, there's often many restrictions um, on when oral feeds can be started or if rectal medications are safe to give, which would necessitate an intravenous form. There's also a significant ease of administration, especially with younger children. It's much easier to try to give them an IV medication with the IV already in place rather than trying to fight with them about an oral or rectal medication. Physiologically, in pediatrics, there's a huge variation in the maturity of their GI tracts, the maturity of their enterohepatic circulatory systems, um, which leads to variable absorption of oral and rectal formulations. When directly compared, intravenous acetaminophen results in a more predictable response in pediatrics than it does um, for oral and rectal formulations. This is particularly true in the younger population of pediatrics. Also, intravenous acetaminophen avoids first pass metabolism. What this means is you get to up to a 50% reduction in toxic hepatic metabolites formed. One of the downsides, however, of IV acetaminophen, unfortunately, is the cost. It's much more expensive than oral and rectal formulations, and that's been one of the main barriers to its widespread adoption. With the evidence supporting um, IV acetaminophen and the lack of research in this area, this has led to our research question, which is in pediatric patients undergoing abdominal or thoracic surgery, does intravenous acetaminophen reduce adverse events and opioid consumption without an increase in postoperative pain? To begin to answer this question, we started with our systematic review. We looked for randomized control trials enrolling pediatric patients of all ages where intravenous acetaminophen was compared to any other modality of pain after surgery. Risk of bias was assessed using the risk of bias 2.0 tool, and we assessed certainty of evidence using the GRADE framework. We identified 896 um, papers, and after um, title and abstract, full text screening, and removing duplicates, we were left with five randomized control trials. These trials enrolled 443 patients with an average age of 2.12 years. Trials enrolled patients aged 0 to 12 with no participants over the age of 12 and none less than 35 correct weeks corrected gestational age. Three studies compared intravenous acetaminophen and opioids to opioids alone. One study compared IV paracetamol, which is just another way to say acetaminophen, to its pro-drug form pro-paracetamol. And one compared intravenous acetaminophen to bupivacaine-based epidurals. Due to the heterogeneity of the comparators, it wasn't methodologically feasible for us to pool all five of these studies together, but we were, however, able to pool the results of the opioid-based studies, and then we'll narratively present the results of the other two studies. Beginning with postoperative pain, we have very low um, certainty evidence suggesting that there's little to no change in postoperative pain um, <clears throat> when IV acetaminophen is used in conjunction with opioids compared to opioids alone. The standard mean difference we calculated after aggregating the pain scores is a decrease in 0 0.20. Using Cohen's criteria, this just meets the criteria for being clinically significant. However, we did back translate the score into an NRS scale on a scale of 0 to 10 because it's commonly used in this area and easier to interpret. That resulted in a decrease of 0 0.23 points on a scale of 1 to 10, 
with a confidence interval ranging from a decrease of 0.88 to an increase in 0.4. We had set our threshold for clinical significance to be one out of 10 on a scale of one to 10. So this outcome does not meet our pre-specified criteria for change. Ultimately, this evidence was rated down due to the significant heterogeneity that you can probably see here in the forest plot, um, as well as imprecision, which is largely related to the small sample size as, and concerns for risk of bias. Our next outcome was opioid consumption. Here we have low quality evidence demonstrating reduction in opioid consumption when IV acetaminophen is added to opioid-based um, pain regimes. We found a reduction in 1.95 morphine equivalent doses per kilogram per 48 hours. More practically, what that means is about a reduction of one dose a day. Um, using thresholds from trials in this topic, we wanted to see a reduction in at least 30%, which we did see with our result, both in the effect estimate and the lower end of the confidence interval. The upper end of the confidence interval does cross a line of no difference, but does not include harm. Ultimately, the quality of evidence, again, is rated down to the incredibly significant heterogeneity that you can see here. Um, as well as risk of bias and imprecision. Much of the heterogeneity can be explained in this setting by the different ways the opioids were given. In the Hong study, they were given by a parent controlled um, anesthetic and in the other trials, it was more scheduled dosing. Minor adverse events were then um, assessed and this combines nausea, vomiting, apnea, bradycardia and urinary retention. We again have low quality evidence suggesting that there's a de decrease in minor adverse events when IV acetaminophen is used in conjunctions with opioids compared to opioids alone. We found a risk um, reduction of 0.39%. This translates into 207 fewer per thousand minor adverse events with a confidence interval ranging from 302 fewer to 146 more. We wanted to see a reduction in at least 35%, again, using data from trials in this topic which we did achieve with our point estimate and with the lower end of our confidence interval. The upper end of our confidence interval does cross a line of no difference, but does not include a clinically relevant harm. Once again, we have serious heterogeneity, decreased precision and risk of bias, which rates down our evidence. However, the large effect size of 0.39% does increase our certainty in this evidence. In terms of um, adverse events from the opioid groups that could not be pooled we have length of intubation, which was found not to be different in one study, reintubation, which was found not to be different, and sedation, which was found to be decreased in the IV acetaminophen group. There were other very important outcomes that were not assessed in this um, group of studies, including supplemental oxygen use, um, time to starting feeds, and time to first bowel movement, as well as length of stay. These are all critically important for patients and families as they're milestones that patients need to meet before they can safely go home. For our non-opioid trials, when IV paracetamol was compared to proparacetamol in children's age 1 to 12 after open inguinal hernia repair, there was no difference in pain score, but a decrease in adverse events. When IV acetaminophen was compared to bupivacaine epidurals in infants age 0 to 6 months after thoracotomies and laparotomies, there was an increase in pain scores and decreased bradycardia, although none of this bradycardia required intervention and was not felt to be clinically significant by the authors. Otherwise, there was no difference in adverse events. So what can we conclude from our research? Ultimately, we have very low to low quality evidence suggesting that when intravenous acetaminophen is added to opioid-based pain regimes compared to opioid-based regimes alone, there's a reduction in adverse events and opioid consumption with little to no change in pain scores. When you think back to the teeter-totter that we talked about at the beginning of this presentation, this becomes a quite interesting result showing us that potentially adding intravenous acetaminophen to these regimes may allow us to reduce opioid exposure without sacrificing pain control, which is really important. Unfortunately, we don't have enough research to draw any conclusions about um, how intravenous acetaminophen compares to the non-opioid adjuncts, and certainly we need to do some more research in this area to help us understand where IV acetaminophen best fits in multimodal pain control regimes. Moving forward, we need to increase the quality of the body of evidence. We can do this by prolonging follow-up. Follow-up range from 48 hours to 72 hours, which if you can imagine after surgery is a very short window for how long pain lasts. We need more patient important outcomes as we spoke of earlier. And we definitely need to include patients of broader age ranges so we can understand how IV acetaminophen might uniquely affect these different ages. Thank you.